Welcome back ladies and gentlemen, VTM here bringing you another Age of Empires 3 match, match number 64 unless I'm very mistaken. This game it's a 3v3 on the can, we're facing a Chinese, a French, and a Spanish, and I will be playing as Portuguese, allied with a German, and a Russian, and as you notice, to start off the game I immediately start off by assigning my villagers all to run to different places, to have my explorer shoot stuff and things get going, and then I see a 90 wood treasure. I tell my explorer, you know what, go shoot something else. I notice that the game is loading very, very slowly, so then I start to spam click marks all over the screen because that's what I do when I'm bored and the game is loading slowly. Anyways, guys, this is going to be a fabulous, fabulous match today, I gotta say. In my personal opinion, this may be the best match I have played, like in terms of just being the most complete match I have yet to put on this channel. I felt like my entire body of work from the beginning to the end was very, very solid this game. So I'm really interested to know in the comments what you guys think. Be sure to let me know, please. Um, I was very, very pleased with how I played is what I'm trying to say, I guess. I do really like Portuguese a lot for many, many, many reasons, a larger variety. I've done a lot lately to improve my play. One of the things I've done to improve my play that you'll be seeing is I did make a new home city for Portuguese. It's a level 100 as opposed to my level 90 I had. And I did that because I needed to make a few better card choices that I, for some reason, hadn't unlocked. And I made better decks, in my opinion, with my Portuguese. Although they still need some work, so don't uh, quote me on that. Anyways, as the game's kicking off, you may notice I had all my villagers go and gather the treasures immediately. Or uh, the crates immediately. We had the food crates gathered with top priority some wood I am gonna gather one coin crate even though you're usually not supposed to gather the coin crates I do want to buy hunting dogs ASAP stats as fast as possible I will be building a market absurdly quickly and I will be hurting that herd back to me but that is why I gathered a coin crate and as you can see I'm building my placing down my market right here right now I do have one wood crate left on the field I do have one coin crate left on the field but neither of those is the end of the world doing lots of fancy schmancy shift clicking and I've gotten myself Another, uh, another treasure, this one being food. And so I've gathered a 90 wood treasure and a 40 food treasure for a com combined total, I think, of 130 resources. And another 130 resources that are actually vital at the beginning of the game is a tremendous, tremendous advantage. And my first card here is going to be Furrier. And I know a lot of people, thank you guys so much, in the last video told me in the comments, economic theory, economic theory, economic theory. But I'm going to say no, 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 no to that. And here's a reason why. Because I'm really focusing on aging up with 14 villagers and aging quickly and then make pumping out musketeers that by the way that's what this video will be me doing a double barracks rush with musketeers because I'm focusing on using musketeers which are food intensive I decided that it's wiser to use furrier be and because I age up with 400 wood by the way let me explain right uh, furrier provides a 20% increase to food gathering now I don't need a bunch of wood if you understand because I'm going to age with 400 and I have 240 currently in my stockpile so that's 640 wood that's two barracks two more houses that's uh, at, at least if I have another two or three villagers gathering wood then I'm already have a plethora of wood for more houses I don't need more than that so it makes no sense in terms of the total amount of resources I will have the potential to gather in this game it makes no sense for me to send economic theory to slightly boost my wood gathering rate whereas since most of my villagers at this point at least in time are going to be on food uh, I'll get more resources total overall from sending Furrier first, so that's why I send Furrier. That does mean that when I age, I will be shifting a few villagers on over to wood, but not that many relatively because, like I said, I don't need it. I'm pretty well off resource-wise in my humble opinion, so I'm not going to stress out about it. I do find an Emperor Zoe's Empress, I believe, Empress Zoe's Handbook on the map, which will increase my population by five, which is even more fabulous. Now I don't have to worry at all really about my population problem, but I do buy Gang Saw, and then I do buy Placer Mines, and that's just because I want the market upgrades for when I do start needing to uh, have my villagers on wood and coin. And here's there's a theory behind buying market upgrades and sending economic cards, right? The theory is if you want to have the strongest economy as possible, you should only gather the resources that you absolutely need or the resources you gather the fastest. So because I have the food card and the hunting dogs upgrade, I gather food the fastest. So in theory, if I wanted to make the best use of my villager time, I should only gather food. However, I do need at this point in time to gather some coin or some wood. So I'm going to shift two over villagers over to wood, but I'm going to leave as many villagers as I can afford to onto food 
because I want to gather as many resources as possible. Does that make sense? So it's like saying if food gathers faster, rather than putting seven villagers on wood and you know just splitting it for no reason, it makes more sense to leave as many as possible onto food to maximize the potential gathering rate. And notice there, I totally stole that treasure and his explorer happened to die there. It was great. And I do decide to send my town center down to the bottom of the map. That way I can really access those herds there without the pressure that's going to be on the middle of the map. I was kind of slightly worried seeing the Chinese player put a lot of pressure on blue while he was trying to build his blockhouse. It, it stressed me out. I was watching it happen and I thought, you know what, this could potentially be bad. So. We're going to back off there. Meanwhile, uh, the Portuguese town center is going to be built. It's going to provide me temp population plus another way to make villagers. And notice now that I'm in the colonial age, I have over a thousand food, almost to a thousand two hundred, and I'm now have villagers gathering coins. So I will now be able to make my musketeers, which cost seventy five food a head pretty pretty sol solidly. So you can see my theory there of not using economic theory uh, paying off. And it's really, really rather effective. I use a little trick I was told, by the way, to get my explorer to stand up. And I don't know the legality of it. I don't know if it's considered cheating or not. I assume that all people do it, but I'm probably going to refrain from doing it anymore. I just learned the trick, and I wanted to try it in-game, and it works really, really well. And that was my phone. My, 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 my sincere, sincerest apologies. Anyways, so as you can see, got musketeers coming. Now we're going to have more musketeers coming shortly thereafter and I'm going to mass my units or at least move my current musketeers on the field to blues blockhouse now what I didn't do well this game is I did not use my hotkeys well I did make a really really good hotkey system but I, I, I'm not quite comfortable with it yet I guess and I, I didn't really utilize it that much this game but fortunately I didn't need to utilize it with that being said I should have utilized it now my second card is going to be spice trade and you might be wondering wait a minute Wait a minute, you're going with a double barracks unit rush without sending 700 wood or 700 food? OMG, BTM, why you so noob? But the reality here is because I'm sending these uh, gathering multipliers, it's actually going to pay off if I can survive long enough to get 700 food. Do you understand that? If I survive longer than, you know, three or whatever minutes that the 700 food would have, that it would take me to get 700 extra food gathered from sending an, an economic upgrade card then it's it was a wiser choice and because there's obviously very little if any pressure on us at this moment and because we're initiating most if not all of the contact it made a lot of sense for me to send those cards rather than the standard you know 700 food or the such unfortunately purple is going to be raiding me with his step Steepy step. I think there's step. I think that's what somebody told me in one of the old videos. I don't remember, unfortunately. But he is rating me with some step riders, which is rather, rather unfortunate. But I'm just going to pop villagers in and out of town centers, shuffle them around. No big losses. Not a big, big deal. One downside, though, to his step riders running down here, even though he's not going to be able to kill any villagers, is it does kind of shift my economic balance. I have four now on food, eight on gold. I don't need eight people on gold. That's rather ridiculous. But unfortunately, I I don't auto-correct it. And you notice there, did you see that? I clicked those villagers to get out, but they're still in the town center. It was glitchy. However, being the smart, educated person I am, okay, that was mean. But if you remember that game I had where the other player was <coughs> Wow, pardon me. But if you remember that game I had where the other player was being raided and he didn't wall off his town center, yeah, I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to wall my town center right now, um, or at least my side of the map. We're going to throw down a wall straight across. Notice I even have my explorer walk in the area. That way I could kind of... I have my explorer walk in the area. That way I could scouted out just a little bit better and my third card I believe overall is going to be silversmith that is correct I'm going to send a coin gathering upgrade rate and at this point if you look at my three card choices even though like maybe my short term mass isn't as good as it could be my long term game is going to be phenomenal because my card choices have been furrier um, I believe economic theory if I didn't already send that I then sent uh, spice trade and now silversmith so in the long run I'm setting myself up to a point where I will be able to spam units as much as possible really as many as I want by nine or ten minutes in and that's when the fighting is going to start that's going to be when our two armies probably initially conflict and by having sent these wise choices I'm now really just going to be like I can make as many men as I want and I can back up our big army not to mention that I've done a pretty decent job keeping us standard if not capable amount of men on the field to begin with i am a little bit low on food though like i said that was because some economic mismanagement happening 
and unfortunately that wasn't good. We do see the step riders running around and on my side of the map. I am kind of keeping an eye on those villagers. I was ready to run them actually to another town center if I felt it was necessary. But it wasn't, as you can see, I kind of kept selecting them then not selecting them. Just just nervous. I didn't want to lose villagers pointlessly. I noticed he's running out though, so I'm like, you know what? We're just going to wall behind him and keep making villagers at this point. Nine minutes in the game, what, we have 30, 40 musketeers on the field. We have almost 30 villagers making more. And we can more or less now make men with impunity with no real major consequences. Our economic strategies are paying off well. We should look to increase the amount of people we have on wood. And that was actually one of the very few things I think I do need to improve upon in this game. I didn't do an amazing job keeping a suitable balance of villagers on wood. And the, that lack of wood production will hurt me. I didn't want to push too far there. Notice, by the way, I only got two musketeers out. I did house myself in this game. Unfortunately, I like I said, wood was my one problem. But I think a lot of other stellar aspects of this game, including card choice and just general long-term how I play. I think kind of evened out or made up for my uh, housing myself, but that's still I, I what I'm saying is I still have areas to improve obviously But we, we did play well fortifyingly we did play well on card choice not the end of the world Pay no attention of course to the 12 idle villagers I have right now and I do send the age one coin gathering Card it might be called blacksmith. I'm not sure off the top of my head it might be something else but now i've sent both home city cards upgrading my berry bush and huntables gathering rate and now i've sent both gathering increasing my mine gathering rate and that really puts me i think at a very very strong position heading into the rest of this game i'm actually second in the game tied for second in the game with score and as the game goes on it will only get better and oh yeah look i can make musketeers as many as i want well not really as many as i want because of course i've housed myself like a noob but you know we gotta take it one step at a time and improve our gameplay meanwhile i have up the amount of villagers I have on wood to four and that would be my my lesson to you guys to walk out of this game uh, I do have a significant surplus of coin if I had maybe let's say seven on coin and seven on wood this entire time I would have then been able to get the second stage market upgrades for food and coin which would have made me a little bit stronger of a competitor granted I've already been playing fairly strong but I think I'm a little bit trapped here uh, by population amount because of or I'm a little bit trapped here by the amount of wood I have. It's trapping my population capacity, even though I could be having more units than I do. It's also forbidding me from getting some of the market upgrades that would probably be beneficial. However, it's not the end of the world. We do have a lot of musketeers on the field, and we will continue to make more. Let me assure you, how it just it wasn't a perfect play strategy by me. At this point, though, I am going to kind of walk my, my musketeers down a little bit. I think I was looking to see if he had any hunting or anything down here at the side of the map. I saw those that big herd there, and I was thinking, when I hit the fortress age, I'm going to want to put a town center there, and I believe that's actually why I'm not making villagers now. It's because I do want to actually indeed get to the third age and start really utilizing the unit or uh, start utilizing having three built town centers and the capacity I have for that. So that's what's going on there. Meanwhile, I'm just shifting villagers around in my economy, trying to use play wisely, but more or less succeeding and failing at points. I really should have gotten the better market upgrades, actually. So I, maybe this wasn't my most complete game. I did buy other unit upgrades later on, though, as you'll see, but it wasn't good. Now, at this point, I do send that villager forward. I want to wall off more of the side of the map I'm on. And I realize, you know what? They have five tier eight posts. And I say, they have these. Because as you know, you've seen me so many games upgrade those and the such. Um, it's a tremendous amount of resources to gain. And it's not good for you to be on the other side of that, not being controlling that. So you really need to control that top trade post, isolate it, gather the resources from the actual trade post itself and the lands around the trade post. Meanwhile, you may notice I did send my 15 or my, not 15, my 50 or so musketeers down the map with my explorer to gather that 10% infantry hit points boost. That is just fabulous for us. And really, it's fabulous. Anytime you're massing musketeers and you get to that kind of treasure, it really just is a game changer. Then I'll obviously try to hit the Fortress Age. And I guess I wasn't not making villagers because I wanted to hit the Fortress Age. I was not making villagers because I'm a noob. So my apologies there. But I'm going to then try to hit the Fortress Age and upgrade my musketeers and then even hit the Industrial Age and upgrade them further. Will that happen? Stay tuned to find out. Meanwhile, I am still walling over the map and red our German alley ally i should say is continuing to put pressure on the trading post and seize them from the unlawful and unright hands of the enemy i thought about sending advanced trading posts there i do send advanced trading posts there 
Uh, spoiler alert, ladies and gentlemen, I never built a trade post this entire game. I have advanced trade post in my map in my deck for maps like Decan, but I didn't use it unfortunately. Now something else here that I probably should have done, since especially at this point I have a surplus of wood, I should have, in my opinion at the very least, I should have built a trading post at the Sufi Mosque and access the natives. They have a 10% gathering bonus to everything, not to mention a 10% villager increase in population, allowing you to make a total of 108 villagers. If you combine that with a 10% gathering rate to everything, and let's say this is a treaty game, that's simply just a ridiculous economic benefit. Meanwhile, he wants a door. Doors will be provided. He didn't speak English, which was, a, which was a little bit difficult in terms of communication. I then said fencing school to increase the speed of my infantry training, and I am going to kind of back my villagers off the plateau soon, realizing that this is a hopeless and a lost cause. Those musketeers backed up by the missionaries are doing a very, very, very good job. And unfortunately, musketeers and pike men are allowing Red's Cav to be completely obsolete. He's not going to come to fight for us here simply because that would be stupid. He'd lose all his Cav with very little to no gain being benefited. So it's really up to Blue and me to kind of face down this this originally 3v2. However, we have managed to kill all of Teal's units. French, he had Curiousers, I believe. I'm not 100% sure on how to pronounce them. He had Curiousers, but we have killed them all and now it's more of a 2v2, but it still took its toll. My units, my number of units are greatly diminished. Green's Musketeers are mopping me up. A number of Strelets that Blue has on the field is also greatly, greatly diminished. So we've kind of lost this battle, and fortunately Red is wise enough because of his rank to pull back and not waste his Yulon, Yulane. Uh, how did somebody tell me? Somebody told me in the comments how to say it. I'm trying to think. They... They even provided a really helpful English translation of it, and I was like, aha, that's how, but I don't remember off the top of my head. At this point, though, I am going to get any units I have on the field out of there, and it is a lost cause. The peninsula is not ours, and I will now send six musketeers, and this is kind of the situation where you want to send unit cards at a point where you have no units to fight and I am going to get out of there now. I should have been getting out of there earlier as you can see. I am going to get 11 musketeers off the field though and that's basically 1,100 resources I'm saving if I get them all safely out of there. So of course I want to get them safe. I will now start building two musketeers. I was only able to save 10 of my musketeers and notice I'm not going to make new musketeers at those barracks because I'm fully expecting those barracks to fall immediately. Meanwhile, Red is at the top of the map putting tons of pressure on Teal playing like a boss knowing that he can't save the middle of the plateau but he can't can cause problems at the other side of the plateau. Meanwhile, I was about to make a bunch of villagers, and I'm like, no, I need to age. So I'm going to use the Exile Prince to fast age to the Fortress Age, with the plan being fall back, wall off the plateau there. I'm going to send that one villager down there to wall off the plateau. That way I can keep utilizing the resources here along the side. Uh, then I will hit the Fortress Age. I will upgrade my Musketeers, and we will fight behind the relative safety and comfort of our own walls. But as you can see here, this wall is going up. That will prevent or that will at least slow down them from coming down to the south if they are indeed interested in coming down to the south to harass me some more and it will also allow me to know if they're there it provides both information and slowing down meanwhile I'm going to get all those villagers out of there all seven of them and I'm really merely going to walk them across the map and send them to the southern herd obviously by the plateau while I'm building where they'll be again relatively safe meanwhile Musketeer upgrade coming, so it will be a tremendous advantage. Now our Musketeers will have the plus 10% hit points increase from the trade or from the treasure, not to mention now they're going to be veteran Musketeers. And even though that won't really negate the benefit that Green's Musketeers have from having the missionaries by them, it will help me. Now, unfortunately, oh, he's trying to tell me Musketeers are useless. I didn't know in-game what he was trying to tell me. Make bows better. And I ask him English. Oh, okay. You want to make, make veteran longbows or uh, crossbowmen. But whatever. I keep making musketeers. And the reason why I do that is because I figured they weren't useless, actually. If I can keep a standing army of musketeers alive, it will help. And the reason why here, twofold. Uh, but I guess the main reason why, even if I had understood what he said in-game, I would not have chosen to make musketeers is because... Teal French is massing his special French Cav all over the place. I don't want to fight crossbowmen against French Cavalry. That is a disaster. Musketeers, even though they may be slightly worse or not as cost-effective against green, 
It is way more cost effective against Teal. They can actually stand and hold their own. It is absolutely crucial that I do not go Crossbowmen. So he actually was making a tactical mistake there by asking me to go for Crossbowmen. If I had, we would have been in a lot of trouble. If Especially now that green is massing some Hussar and some Lancers on the field. It's only getting worse. However, that is a downside of speaking English on a team that is not speaking so much English. Meanwhile, I'm going to send six Castadors or eight Castadors, I believe, from my home city for my first card in the Fortress Age. That way, I really, really, really back up and support. That way, I back up and support my current military. Eight units, I figured, at this point could be a game changer, especially if they really push in strongly. Meanwhile, I am holding off all three countries. I'm holding off both purple and teal and green. Blue's got some Strelets there. Red has maybe five Ulane. But really, it's my army is kind of doing the deed. There's a little bit of a lag spike here. My apologies to you viewers. Overall, this match wasn't too bad in terms of the lag. I am low on food. I do have 49 villagers on the field, which isn't bad at all. But... Uh, just a resource distribution could be a little bit better, but also just because I'm burning through my resources. I do have almost a thousand wood, though. That's kind of useless. However, it's going to pay off as soon as I start building mills, which I believe, if I remember correctly, will be soon. I do finally, I believe, get steel traps, which took me long enough, but good. I did send, by the way, in this little battle here, I sent the forward part of my musketeers into melee mode. That way I could engage his horses immediately. Um and force him to retreat which we do now both blue and red have cannon on the field and now this is where the thing gets things get interesting we have to pursue and i say this i say 31 and i tell them pursue even though i'm the sergeant and they didn't want me to play because i am so low ranked i am telling them what to do and saying push forward we have the advantage we need to kill them meanwhile i am going to build a mill because i do have surplus wood i'm going to send both villagers there to that mill or both trade posts i'm going to or not trade posts i'm going to send both town centers waypoints to that mill and i'm going to pump out villagers onto that mill so hopefully my food situation will rectify itself and all will be right in the universe one more time. Meanwhile, we mocked up a bunch of Green's army with relatively minimal losses. That's a tremendous amount of resources lost relatively for Green. And now we're going to go do the exact same thing to those purple pikemen we see. Purple pikemen, say that for one five times fast. Now we're going to do that to purple, and we're going to keep walling and pushing forward and doing devious measures such as the ones we have been doing. And we really are now in the driver's seat. We went from being in a lot of trouble to now really just being at a point where we can now kick them in the teeth and take the game back. 19 minutes in the game. Red has hit the industrial age. Congratulations to him. I will give you a cookie. And now we're pushing. My, my musketeers are now veteran with obviously the previously mentioned treasures. And now I'm at a point where I really can spam them out in batches of 10 with impunity. And I will push forward. I'm buying mill upgrades. And really, Teal's calves cavalry spamming ways are actually just a, a waste of money against me if he tries to attack my mass with some cav i have more than enough musketeers on the field obviously so the musketeers that are engaged in melee mode against the cab will be in trouble and the ones in the back will tear them apart with musket balls being shot at them at high velocity from the ancient rifles or the old caliber rifles that were being used because this war or this game is set in a older time of war. Actually, I have no idea what I was saying there. My sincerest apologies, ladies and gentlemen. I will send the villagers to that mine. I'm just here working on making sure that uh, all 56 of my villagers are happily dispersed. Meanwhile, uh, cannon on the field, I'm going to get out of there. I have no interest in losing men for no gain, but I will... Because both blue and red have cannon and red has a massive Ulane, I will merely circle my musketeers around hoping that if green doesn't decide to push forward, I can maybe flank him from behind, grab him from the rear, and force myself upon him. And if that is inappropriate to you, then I guess you guys just aren't clean people. Alright, I'm sorry, that was inappropriate. I just I thought that was kind of funny. But anyway, meanwhile, I'm still making musketeers, and now I'm going to be making barracks again on the plateau. The tide, like I said, has completely shifted. We've taken the game again, and now just a few minutes after losing the plateau and being kicked off it, we our counterattack has successfully kicked them off the plateau, and now we're going to march in and finish the deed, so to speak. I'm not making villagers, though. Bad. Bad, 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 BTM, big noob, but I have a ton of resources relatively, and I have a ton of military men, 147 population out of 167 pop possible, meanwhile I'm finishing cleaning up the scraps of 
green from the plateau and now it's going to be the exact opposite situation where the other team is trying to stop our counter attack pardon me another burp mm. I am feeling very burpy today apparently but uh, now they're gonna be trying to stop our counter attack but we obviously push in there very very aggressively and hard and blue and red let me just take the moment here to point out and give them the proper congratulations they have simply done a fantastic job at keeping their field guns alive or their falconets alive they have all four of their falconets on the field by the way i'm sending royal mint here to kind of further boost my economy because economics is a way to go but they've done a fabulous job keeping all their falconets alive and not losing them like yours truly does i lose falconets like nobody's business it's like i make them and they're dead instantly they did a good job Unfortunately, though, green has its own quite large mass of falconets, which is less than ideal. Um, I was going to march forward and push my men to die, but I decided, you know what, I'm going to back my men up. I'm going to keep them by the falconets. I'm going to put them in defend mode with the hopes here that we can keep, let red and blue do their thing, and maybe they will micro out green's falconets. I tell them to micro out green's falconets in case it was not obvious but my musketeers are there really just to provide a meat and ranged shield for the falconets if at all possible and it's possible that if the enemies ignore my musketeers and micro out the falconets my musketeers will do enough damage on the, their falconets to kill them which would be nice to say the least so as you can see though even at this point in the battle red and blue have kept all their falconets alive on the field which is simply just fabulous and i am keeping my horde of musketeers there to act as a giant sponge sponging all the ugly melee damage that is trying to come in and hurt us i am just throwing myself in front of the in front of the cavalry for my teammates saying i will save you like the hero i am meanwhile i'm about to industrial age and when i do i will upgrade my musketeers to a level of musketeerness that you have never seen before from me because btm does not upgrade his units until now btm has learned the error of his ways and now units are being upgraded market upgrades are being bought villager production is staying relatively solid not phenomenal but it's been a lot worse for me in the past and the game goes on. Not to mention, I now have two organ guns coming out on the field. I can't afford the mu musketeer upgrade just yet, but I will be buying it, I assure you, as soon as possible. But at this point in the game, people are about to start resigning. Purple resigns now. Green will resign shortly thereafter. But Teal will actually fight on with some cavalry, run them around the map, and try to be a pain for a bit. But we will end up killing him. And the game will then conclude with us in victory. Sorry for the spoiler, um, but I figured that cuts off, what, nine minutes of video if you really don't want to watch my post-game pep talk and my analysis. Uh, feel free to leave now if you already haven't. I will not be hurt. My feelings, they will be fine, I assure you. But anyway, so we finish up the game here. I will be obviously looking to get my upgrades of my Musketeers quickly just because it's awesome to buy unit upgrades. And I gotta say, the biggest difference, in my opinion... We'll, and the post game will uh, corroborate this, but the biggest difference I think in just my playing level or how well I played really was the card choice. I think sending Furrier, Spice Trade, and then the two mine upgrade cards. I think they really, really made a tremendous difference just in my level of play, in terms of the amount of resources I had and the amount of men I was able to field on the on the game. Notice I didn't send a thousand wood, I didn't send seven hundred wood, I didn't send seven hundred coin, I did not send seven hundred food. I only sent one military unit card in the second age and one in the third age. So it's leading me to think about in team games maybe I should focus more on upgrades rather than resource shipments because resource shipments weren't really coming in that handy and resource shipments as a whole are not that necessary and now I'm understanding how people in the game have such high relatively scores and we're always like how do you have such a high score it's because they're sending upgrades rather than simple resource shipments so anyway at this point though green is out as well we have defeated him and now teal really is just going to be stupid for a bit and we're going to kill him but that's really what I've learned from this game the last few games I played with Portuguese is that upgrading how fast you gather things is just it it's a game changer it's, it really is what makes you a better player if you can learn to survive and play the game while sending the card upgrades rather than a one-time lump shipment of resources then you just become a better better player overall and i'm not making villagers because i didn't really feel like i needed to to be honest uh you know, I get lazy when the game's won, and with two out of three people dead, I'm just like, well, you know, eh, 
you know, I have 63 villagers, 29 on food, 15 on wood, 19 on coin, more than enough of all the resources I want. I could even look to go Imperial if I wanted. I don't think I've ever gone Imperial in a rush game, at least not one on camera. I think there was one off camera where the guy was being really stupid and it was a 1v1 and I went to Imperial Age and I bought spies just so I can hunt them down and kill them. Actually, I'm going to make some more villagers just because I can. Um, I remember thinking to myself in game, I should make it just so I get used to always making villagers. But it doesn't matter. Meanwhile, we're just going to finish killing out Teal and up oh, there comes his cav. Yep, he's just going to try to be stupid with his French cavalry, but it will not phase people such as us because we'll kill them and we'll move on with their life unfortunately we have to deal with it before he quits and I gotta say let me just take this moment to interject and say there's a difference between being brave and fighting on and being stupid and just annoying people what our team did when we lost the plateau and we backed up and we kept fighting even though it looked really grim that was brave that was called all right we're not gonna quit we're gonna stick with it it's not the end of the world and it ended up paying off and we ended up winning what Teal is doing right now is just annoying. No offense if you're watching this, Teal. I, I don't begrudge you at all. I and mean, I know people, you know, if you, this is what you enjoy playing, how you enjoy playing the game and the such. Don't let me stop you or, like, kind of rain on your parade. But let me just say, it's kind of like you already lost, man. Nobody looks at you and says, oh, man, I have so much more respect for him at now. You know what I mean? It, it, I don't know. It just frustrates me. But I am here going to be getting my max population of 205 units. That is right. I don't think you've ever seen me have a max population with 67 villagers. Nine of them idle, though. But uh, it's kind of a high unemployment rate, unfortunately for us. But Portugal's kind of dealing with a recession right now. This war on the Battle of Decan has been dragging on for so long. 27 minutes and counting. 31 in the video timer, actually. And that's really just because of uh, a few... Small lag spikes. I really hope they weren't that bad watching it. Uh, I could watch this back and find out. Maybe I will. But I would like to point out here, if you look at the game, uh, leading the game in scores, you are truly with Portuguese doing a better job than everybody else. Something that rarely happens. Usually I'm behind three ages and uh, I'm, you know, trying to keep up, you know, sticking to my crossbowmen while everybody else has great bombards and imperial hussars. But that is not happening in this game. And now I'm just kind of spreading my army out, looking around. Trying to contribute to the war however and wherever I can. And trying to see if Teal's hiding unit somewhere that we missed. That way he'll actually resign. I, I was getting kind of pissed off at this point. Like, wait, really? You haven't resigned yet? What is this madness? You know, but he will resign soon, I'm assured. And it won't be the end of the world. Meanwhile, Teal's still kind of running around at the trade post at the top of the map. Frustrating. Stupid. Yes, I'm going to upgrade my factories out just because I can. And I'm going to keep making sure that my resource gathering ways are gathering resources as quickly as possible just so I can keep up with everything and do well. Meanwhile, Red is kind of hunting down the last of Teal and finishing him off. And I thought possibly there was units down here. And I was actually very, very surprised to find out that the Chinese player didn't pull off his side of the town so I mean if I was playing a civilization I was a little bit more dependent on raiding rather than just pumping out a bajillion musketeers I would have loved if I was like playing Sioux or German to really raid purple and take advantage of the fact that he didn't wall but whatever uh, I, walling in critical places can be a game changer as we've seen in previous videos but it was a good game and I was really really proud with how I played I led the game in score which is something I do not do especially when I'm the lowest rated play in the game let me just say walking into the game lobby by the way look there most resources most military units most units killed highest score and most treasures the awards list is a wall of yellow btm rocked this game but it was kind of fun for me to play this well this particular game because in the game lobby they did not want me to play they're like uh no he's too low ranked and i was like but 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 and then another sergeant happened to walk in and they're like we'll just split the sergeants but i was very very pleased to play well let me just say that to say the least and i had 10 improvements i don't think i've ever had 10 improvements in a game before uh not as many as purple's 15 but it's still 10, very, very respectable for me. 277 units, and units killed, I actually tied for the most with red, which was, to me, tremendously amusing. But we both killed exactly 203 units, so we did a fabulous job. And I even outmasked the Russian player, and I outmasked him by 30 units, and I outmatched the next closest person by nearly 100 units. So if you want to tell me in the comments that sending 700 food or 700 wood 
would have been a better choice. I would like you to because I'm just going to point you to the results here. I, I, I didn't have any trouble keeping out units on the field and I didn't need those cards. In fact, I might even make a deck specifically for team games where I don't put those cards in and maybe I have another unit upgrade or something that might be a little bit more useful long term. I'm not sure, but we'll see just because it, it was interesting. I didn't need them. I did well. Villager count wasn't good either. I mean, it wasn't bad if you look at everybody else, but I was kind of run of the mill. I wasn't absurdly better than people whereas my resource count was. So you can't say that, oh man, you just had a bajillion villagers because you were Portuguese, even though I probably should have. It really was those cards that really put me over the top and allowed us to decimate in this game. So if you're watching this and you're wondering how to play Portuguese, I know that a lot of people don't say you should use it, but use Furrier, use Spice Trade, use Economic Theory, and use the two coin gathering cards. If you're going with a Crossbowman Pikeman mix, I take out the two coin gathering cards and put in two wood chopping cards instead and uh, that's my that's my lesson for you guys today. Uh, economic investment cards, if you can hold on, just pay off so fabulously. And I'd just like to thank you guys so much for watching. It was a pleasure. I know we plan to can a lot, but it's just how the community is these days. A bunch of stubborn people who only plan to can. And before I leave, I do have a quote from Sun Tzu and the Art of War that I'm pleased to bring you today. And it says, if fighting is sure to result in victory, then you must fight, even though the ruler forbid it. If fighting will not result in a victory, then you must not fight, even at the ruler's bidding. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is BTM. I'd like to thank you guys so much for watching. And until next time, good luck and happy hunting.